Well, our next presentation is from the, uh, Dr. Kirti Das, who is the um, postdoctoral researcher at uh, Princeton University in the Department of Civil Environmental Engineering. He's also affiliated with uh, Sustainable Healthy City Network, Urban Nexus uh, Lab, and MS uh, Chanda Center of Global India at the Princeton University. Um, his research uh, um, interest includes the impacts of uh, urban planning uh, practices and policy on public health, urban sustainability, and equity across the globe. His presentation is, uh, uh, today is titled uh, Neighborhood Built Environment, Out of Home uh, Leisure and the Everyday Happiness. He will share with us his finding on study conducted in the Twin, C Twin Cities metro area to uh, uh, elucidate the relationship between the neighborhood built environment and emotional well being. Welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, I would like to thank the Dynamica team for having me here. Truly an amazing experience, having worked on the Dynamica app for some time and collected data through it. It's great to be here and talking about the data that we have been using. Uh, my presentation takes uh, urban planning perspective, that being my line of work. Uh, and I'll be talking about using digital day reconstruction to explore neighborhood built environment, neighborhood activity, and everyday happiness. So about just in today's presentation, quickly we're talking about understanding human neighborhood interactions using subjective well-being uh, to understand these interactions. I'll go over a study methodology of a study that we conducted between 2016 and 17 in the Twin Cities metro area. Uh, talk about analysis and findings, talk about some participant experiences using Dynamica during the survey. Uh, I think we were one of the first studies to use Dynamica to collect data. Uh, and also some key takeaways from the presentation. So as urban planners, we design neighborhood environments uh, for people to thrive in them, and also for them to use it and have access to all the amenities possible. So with that in mind, we had two ideas that we wanted to explore for our study. The first being, how do people respond to the neighborhood built environment? Does it make them happy? Does it make them sad? Are there certain attributes of the neighborhood environment that do make people happy? The second question that we wanted to look at was, what about the neighborhood environment encourages people to spend time there? Since we're designing these environments, we want people to use them, so we want to know what is making people use these environments. That led us to two research questions. The first being, what aspects of the neighborhood built environment are correlated with well-being? And the second, what aspects of the neighborhood built environment are correlated with spending more time on activities within the neighborhood? Now, time within the neighborhood being an easier concept to understand. Um, well-being, maybe everyone's not familiar with that, so I'll take a minute to talk about what well-being is. So primarily, well-being is defined as an individual's feelings or thoughts about their life and how desirable it is, regardless of how others see it, and that defines a good life for them. There's an extended body of research on well-being. Uh, it's found that there are three components to well-being. The evaluative, how you think about your life, which tends to be more long-term. The emotional, how you feel, which can be short-term and is also more interactive. So for example, you being here, you feel a certain way while you are coming from home, spending time at home. You interact with different things and you feel differently. And then finally, you have the idiomonic, which is more related to the purpose that you feel you have in life. Uh, since we're focusing on interactions between humans and the built environment, we'll be focusing on the emotional aspect of well-being. So traditional measures of well-being uh, capture feelings or emotions with reference to a particular point in time or over a period of time. And what I mean by that is uh, I could ask you how happy you are right now or ask you about your emotions. That's a particular point in time. And over a period of time could be me asking you about how you felt in the last week or the last month. That's over a period of time. It has two important uh, components to it, positive affect, that's positive emotions that you feel, like happiness, joy, contentment, and negative affect, which is negative emotions you feel, like anger, fear, and anxiety. And having a higher emotional well-being is having more positive emotions than negative emotions. So with that being said, uh, when we started to look at these questions, we ran into some challenges uh, in terms of the data that we had to collect to answer these questions. So in relation to the first question, what aspects of the neighborhood built environment affect well-being, we found that traditional uh, subjective well-being or emotional well-being measures were inadequate because they were not dynamic. We're trying to measure people's interactions and see how they feel about those interactions. So asking you about how you felt yesterday or how you felt a week ago 
or a month ago will not necessarily capture those interactions. Uh, for example, if you uh, had something bad happen to you at 7 o'clock in the evening, I ask you at 7.01, how was your day? Uh, the answer is probably going to be affected by what happened at 7 o'clock. So we need something that's more interactive, which is, kind of captures how you're feeling when you're at a park, how you're feeling when you're at a train. So capture those interactive experiences. And second, when it came to looking at time uh, spent in activities within the neighborhoods, you need very comprehensive data. You need spatial data, you need temporal data, and you also need user input. And traditionally, you use travel diaries or you use a GPS tracker uh, in conjunction with a survey, and these are extremely tedious, not only for the user who's filling them out, but also for the researchers who are collecting this data. And as you can see, I cannot afford to lose more hair. So we were looking for a good way of doing this. And then you have some things that are common, issues that were common. Uh, so you need data over several days. I think other people have shown this as well. There's a difference how people act between weekdays and weekend days. So if you're looking at emotions or if you're looking at activity, you need to have a variation. Uh, additionally, you don't want to capture just unusual days. So for example, you have a snowstorm and you collect data for one day so you can say goodbye to your emotional well-being study because you know how people will be feeling that day. And then I mentioned briefly user burden of existing tools. It's very cumbersome to fill out these uh, travel diaries, for example. You have people recalling what they did, when they did it, uh, uh, where they were when they did it, and then answering questions about them. And what that leads to, at a certain extent, is recall bias, where people forget certain activities and trips that they were partaking in, and so the, the accuracy of the data that you get at the end is not that great. And finally, survey distribution and post-processing. Uh, distributing surveys when you're looking at something, for example, studying it over a period of one week, you have to distribute the surveys to people, you have to keep constant tabs on whether it's being filled out properly or not, and then obviously you have to join data in the end. For example, if you're using a GPS stacker and uh, paper surveys, you have to join that data in the end. So these were some of the challenges we were faced with, and which led us to considering digital day reconstruction, and Dynamica in particular. Uh, and there were some benefits why we chose Dynamica. First of all, the data was comprehensive. It collects data across multiple dimensions. So uh, the temporal aspects, the spatial aspects, and the user, in, uh, user input aspects were all in one place. Uh, then it lowered the respondent burden as well, uh, because people don't have to recall what trips and activities they were in. As you've seen, Dynamica breaks that down into a calendar. You have the activities and trips listed, so you are more likely to remember all the details of what you did. That leads to higher data accuracy. And because the user burden is lower, it also creates the potential for longer studies. In our case, we used the app for a seven-day study uh, where people were filling out data. Uh, Simplify survey distribution. It's an app. Once it's out there, at the back end, you can track who's filling out what. Uh, I think Julian talked about monitoring the data and seeing people not be filling out surveys. And you can do that. You have the ability to do that. You send people an email saying that, you know what, you didn't fill out the survey for today, and they can do that. So the, the management part of it is uh, a lot easier. And also, the ability to com control the output that comes out uh, also makes post-processing of data significantly easier. So with that being said, uh, coming to our study, since we were looking at the built environment, we wanted to look at diverse neighborhoods. So in the Twin Cities metro area, uh, unfortunately, there wasn't a way to measure infrastructure directly within the neighborhoods of the built environment, so we used income as a proxy. So using lower and middle income neighborhoods, we selected some neighborhoods, then we were looking at other things that affect the built environment. So we looked at suburban and urban form. And finally, because access to light rail changes the amenities that you can access from where you are at, we used light rail as a consideration as well. So we ended up with six neighborhoods that we included in our study. In terms of the survey process, uh, we did our survey for a period of seven days. Uh, we did have an entry and exit survey uh, that we conducted for some collecting some demographic information, and then the person used uh, the Dynamica app on a phone that we provided to them for seven days. Uh, participants also got a $50 gift card uh, for participating in the survey. And while the survey was going on, Dynamica also developed uh, uh, inbuilt survey applicability. So we, we missed out on that, but it's something that exists that can be used now as well. So our total sample size was 398, and you can see uh, the division based on the neighborhood. And given how temperamental the weather in Minnesota can be, we collected data over a period of a year because we wanted to capture all seasons, all kinds of variations, because the cold weather can affect both your activity within your neighborhood and your well-being. So this is kind of a historical picture from 2016 of the Dynamica app and how it looked. 
so as you've seen before, uh, you have uh, items that are created on kind of a calendar. And if you click on any of those items, you have a host of questions that come up. So for our study, the measures that we collected using Dynamica, which wouldn't have been possible otherwise, were first the emotional measure. I think people have talked about this before. Uh, for each activity and trip, we had people ask, answer questions about six emotions, happy, meaningful, pain, sadness, tired, and stressed. Uh, we then used these emotions to classify each episode into being pleasant or unpleasant. So if there was a preponderance of negative emotion, it became an unpleasant uh, event. And then we calculated something called the U-index, which was an index of the unpleasant time, averaged it over the seven-day period that people were using the app and got U-index scores for them. Uh, for the neighborhood activity, uh, and Sam, thank you for the 0.5-mile buffer thing. Uh, because <laughs> we used a 0.5-mile buffer uh, around the respondent's home. Uh, to calculate the ratio of time they spent within their neighborhood. So we defined the neighborhood as a 0.5 mile uh, buffer around a person's home. And we used that to ca calculate the ratio of time, which is what we used in our analysis. Uh, we were one of the first studies to include about 58 uh, uh, covariates of uh, both well-being and time spent to be able to understand the relation between them. Uh, so that included household infrastructure variables, neighborhood infrastructure, social provisioning systems, uh, and a lot of control variables in terms of social demographics. We were also one of the first studies to include uh, determinants from uh, uh, psychology and public health. So we had optimism and general health measures in there as well to see how much the neighborhood actually accounted for. Uh, and a majority of these attributes at the neighborhood level uh, were measured on a one to five satisfaction scale, which is what we used for our analysis. So in terms of what our data look like compared to the metro, uh, as was common in uh, most surveys at the time, we had a higher percentage of female participants and older participants in our survey. But across other uh, dimensions, the, the data was pretty representative of the metro area. Now looking at the two main variables we were talking about. So first, talking about the percentage of unpleasant time reported. Uh, Phillips and Near North had the highest number of unpleasant time reported. They are lower income urban neighborhoods in Minneapolis. Similarly, looking at the percentage of time spent conducting activities within the neighborhood, uh, we see Brooklyn Center and Blaine, which are suburban neighborhoods, people spent less time in their neighborhoods there. So now to explore the reasons for why this was happening, we conducted a regression analysis. The details are not included here. Would love to talk to you more after the presentation about them. Uh, as I mentioned, there were a lot of variables in our models. Uh, we found that a lot of things were not associated, which are listed there. Now jumping to things that mattered, uh, we found that active transportation infrastructure, which included safety from traffic, sidewalks, bike trails and paths, street lighting, snow removal, and street cleaning, was associated with well-being. The green arrow pointing upward means that it's a positive relationship. We also found that safety from crime in the neighborhood was associated with higher well-being. A lot of personal attributes were also associated with well-being. Won't spend too much time talking about them. Uh, but now coming back to the neighborhood attributes, we looked at active transportation infrastructure and we found that the satisfaction across the neighborhoods was pretty similar. However, the case was not the same for safety. We found that in Phillips and Near North, the satisfaction with safety uh, from crime was significantly lower, uh, pointing to potential equity issues in terms of well-being outcomes. Now jumping on to the time spent in the neighborhood similarly, a uh, lot of things that were not associated listed there. In terms of neighborhood attributes, we found that grocery stores and markets, uh, farmers markets within the neighborhood, satisfaction with them was linked with more time spent. Parks, more time spent. Garbage collection and trash removal also resulted, uh, higher satisfaction resulted in more time spent in the neighborhood. Once again, some personal attributes listed here that were also associated. The red arrows pointing down means a negative effect. We looked at the satisfaction scores across neighborhoods. We found that garbage collection and trash removal was not very different across the neighborhoods. However, when it came to quality grocery stores, we found that there was difference in satisfaction across the neighborhoods. However, we didn't identify a suburban or urban pattern here or a higher lower income. There were just some neighborhoods that were not satisfied. And finally, uh, average satisfaction with parks in the neighborhood. Over here, we did see the urban lower income neighborhoods included in our study reported lower satisfaction with parks. So uh, that was just a brief view of what we were able to do using Dynamica and kind of build these profiles to answer two research questions that we had. Uh, since we were one of the first large studies using the Dynamica app, we also wanted to get people's input on how, what they thought of the app. So we asked them about their user experience within our survey. So the first question we asked them was how satisfied or dissatisfied were they using the Dynamica app? And as you can see, about 68% said that they were 
satisfied or very satisfied with the app. And for anyone who's done a seven day study, you know that even if one person likes you at the end, you've achieved something. <laughs> so 68 is a really good number. And next we asked people whether using Dynamica uh, made them more aware of their activity and travel behavior. And about 69% said that it did. So apart from being able to collect data for research, it also made the users more aware of their own behavior, uh, which, which was great and we got really positive reviews about that. So in terms of some key takeaways, uh, we were able to identify some aspects of the neighborhood that were associated with well-being. We found that uh, in lower income urban neighborhoods, safety from crime is something that could improve subjective well-being. We also had things that we found encourage people to spend time in their neighborhoods. Uh, we didn't necessarily find a pattern here, uh, with the exception of parks, where the improvement of parks in lower income urban neighborhoods could encourage people to spend more time. And we found that digital day reconstruction using Dynamica was a very effective and efficient method to collect this kind of granular data. And I'd also like to mention that uh, before we started our study, we did look at other applications that were out there. There were uh, uh, apps that were trying to do similar things at MIT, Berkeley, and uh, FSU. Uh, however, there were some drawbacks in data accuracy, and they also uh, had an app portion, and all the background information needed to fill that, be filled out in an online survey. So there was a lot of issues in terms of being able to join the data and the, the burden to research in general that I mentioned previously. Uh, so that concludes what I had to say. I would be happy to answer any questions or talk to you later about the study. Thank you. Thank you, Curdy. Any questions from the audience? Thank you. I, I, I first want to thank you so much for that very wonderful graphics. And in that presentation, I really like those, how you presented those uh, data and findings in a very simple way. Anyway, just a very quick question. The unpleasant time, is that the self-reported unpleasant time by the, by the respondents that I was unpleasant, or how did you measure that? Yes, so the unpleasant time is primarily measured by those six emotions that I talked about. So for each activity and trip, you answer six questions about emotions. It's self-reported on a scale of zero to six. How strongly did you feel that emotion? And to, for an episode to be unpleasant, the, the unpleasant emotions have to be higher than the pleasant emotions that you felt. So, for example, being more sad than being more happy makes an uh, episode unpleasant. Okay, okay. I am, actually, I'm not uh, much uh, like familiar with the emotional, uh, um, the studies that, that used to do with the emotional experiences or thing. Like, um, but from the morning, I was uh, really fascinated uh, by, uh, by listening to different uh, presentation on this same topic. So I'm also wondering one more thing, uh, especially uh, uh, I'd refer to the last presentation that was also on, um, on happiness. Yeah, so uh, in my mind, I, I was thinking like, if one person's like containment or, or satisfaction level varies, like, I am satisfied with a $50 Nike shoe. The other person is, is, is not satisfied even a $150 Nike shoe. So how does that level, the dif difference of this level differ in our objective measure of happiness or satisfaction or whatever? Right. Do, do you have anything to control in yeah, that? That's why it's called subjective well-being. It's subjective. It's, it's based on your own measurement of how you're feeling at the time. And the idea over here, as somebody who designs urban spaces for you, is that regardless of what your measurement is, we'll try and make you happier. So that's why your score, regardless of how you are considering it, and your standards might be different from the person next to you, that's why it's important to the, the person who's researching. And hence the name subjective, because it is self-reported. And you're absolutely correct. Everyone uses a different criteria to be able to report how happy they are with things. So again, when we are, we are aggregating all these subjective measures, into a single graph. That graph contains uh, uh, like all the respondents' subjective responses that differed according to their own personal subject, I mean, uh, experiences or level. So the aggregated measure, that message, uh, do you think that that message uh, is kind of objective? Or like, think about the, the gap, like uh, the gap, the graph we saw in the last presentation, there is a, uh, there is a gender gap yeah, so that is kind of final, final findings right. that came out of all the subjective measures. So we came to the conclusion that there is a gap. But that gap was created, or the graph was created by the subjective measures of all those respondents. 
Right. I'm not sure if, uh, even what I'm talking about. Like, no, 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 I'm I, just... no, no. It, it's a valid question. This thing about subject and objective is very different. So in, in terms of health-based research, one of the, so well-being is a subjective measure. So for example, mortality is a more objective measure as well, right? Like if you're dead, you're dead, right? right? So, so that's the idea of subjective measures to begin with, that they are your responses. For example, it's not just the well-being, the satisfaction with all the neighborhood attributes is also subjective, right? Yeah. So it's a lot of subjective measures together. So what you're saying is absolutely correct, uh, but it is a combination of subjective measures. Uh, another way you can get around that kind of subjective confounding that people have different feelings and different kind of baseline levels of happiness. In our study, we actually use, and I didn't get a chance to talk about this too much, but we use a, a within-person model. Um, so we use this fixed effects approach that is actually estimating within a single person how their experiences are changing from setting to setting. So that can control for, you know, that, that notion that uh, I'm a person that's uh, satisfied when I get a Nike shoe or whatever. You know, you, you have the same level of Nike satisfaction over and over. That's, you're capturing the variance that's kind of attributable in theory to the exposure. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, for that feedback. I think uh, during the lunch break that maybe you uh, can have a more uh, uh, thorough, uh, detailed uh, conversation on this. Wonderful. <laughs>